on the air with breaking news on multiple fronts, starting with the clock ticking for former President Trump now that he's a target of the special counsel's investigation into a scheme to interfere with the 2020 election. What this means for another potential indictment, the timing, and the new reaction you may not expect from his political rivals. Also new tonight, the first word from the defense secretary on that American soldier who apparently ran across the North Korean border and is now in their custody. What we're learning tonight about who he is and how the U.S. plans to get him home. Plus, new allegations about orders given to push migrant kids and babies back into the water at the border. Others, including a woman suffering a miscarriage, allegedly hurt by barbed wire. The shocking emails accusing Texas officials of inhumane treatment and the new response we're getting in tonight. Then, into us in just literally the last few minutes, a new twist in the mystery of who murdered Tupac. What we're just hearing from Las Vegas police about a new search. More on that, plus more on Miami's messy mania as he hits the pitch for his first U.S. practice. Our team's one-on-one -on -one interview with another star player who knows what it's like to bend it in the world spotlight. That sit down with David Beckham later on in the show. And in the next couple of hours, we may hear from former President Trump for the first time about the fact that he is almost certainly going to be arrested again on federal charges, according to legal experts. Here's why we think that and what we know right now. Mr. Trump's attorneys now have what's called a target letter from the special counsel, Jack Smith, as part of Smith's investigation into a scheme to overturn the legitimate results of the 2020 election. How do we know that there is a target letter? Well, we know that from Mr. Trump himself. He scooped it on his own platform, calling Jack Smith deranged, acknowledging that he's a target, and saying these letters almost always mean an arrest and indictment. Legal experts say that's true, by the way. If this all sounds familiar, it's because it kind of is. Mr. Trump also got a target letter over a different part of the special counsel's investigation a month and a half ago into those classified documents found at Mar-a-Lago. That letter came May 19th. 20 days later, Mr. Trump was indicted on those three dozen federal charges. So we can't stress this enough. The clock is now ticking. And we have a pretty good idea of what the special counsel is looking into. Plots by Mr. Trump and his inner circle to keep him in power. Specifically, plans to create sets of fake electors, basically made up groups of people in several key swing states who would go against what voters wanted to pick Mr. Trump instead of President Biden, who actually won. That's the fake electors scheme we'll talk about. All of it leading up to the attack on the Capitol by Donald Trump supporters on January 6th, part of a push from some to force then Vice President Mike Pence to hand Mr. Trump the election based on all those lies. Now, here's what we don't know for sure. What could Mr. Trump be charged with if, if those charges are in fact coming? Could it be what he did related to the Capitol attack? Could it be his involvement, perhaps, in one of those schemes? We don't know. But we can say that experts see this case as potentially the most serious against Mr. Trump, all part of a web of legal issues that also includes charges in New York on the state level and potentially charges that could come in Georgia. And Mr. Trump's political allies, like House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, they see it a little differently. Listen. I think the American public is tired of this. They want to have see equal justice, and the idea that they utilize this to go after those who politically disagree with them is wrong. We're going to get some new details on an investigation out of Michigan with Maura Barrett in a second, but I want to start with Garrett Hake and Laura Jarrett, because Garrett, big signal here that the special counsel is close to wrapping up his investigation into not just the Capitol attack, but this broader scheme around this push to overturn the election. Talk us through the highlights here. Yeah, look, I mean, the, Don, the special counsel understands how Donald Trump operates, and I would be shocked if they sent this letter not expecting it to become public. Any DOJ investigation, any federal investigation, they don't like to do their work out of the open. It's why the FBI has a standard policy of not commenting on ongoing investigations. So sending this letter to Donald Trump is the functional equivalent of, you know, publishing it on social media themselves. That tells me that this is an investigation that's pretty close to over, and it's not hard to understand why. The universe of people who you would need to talk to or could potentially charge is finite in this investigation. We're several years on from January 6th now, and we know most of the key players have spoken to the special counsel or to the DOJ before the special counsel took over. So every indication is that this investigation is close to wrapping up. I think to me, and this is a question that's out of my lane, but perhaps better in Laura's, is whether the four-day timeline that Mr. Trump says he has been given to come testify really means that we're dealing on, you know, 
you know, a week or less until potentially charges could be filed, or if that's just the timeline for him to button things up, and there could still be other I's to dot or T's to cross, just given how broad we know this investigation really is. We're all family here, so Laura, what, what do you say to that? What, what, what's the answer? Do we know? It's fair to expect um, that this is coming soon, but it may not be this week. It may take a little bit. There may be a lag. Um, we know that the attorney general uh, may get his eyes on it. He doesn't have to, uh, but the special counsel certainly could give him a heads up or at least inform of what's going on. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's imminent. It just may not be this week. There's also a part of the Truth Social post, as Garrett Hake has been noting uh, ever since it dropped, it is yet again Donald Trump breaking his own news here. But it says, I have the right, he says, to protest an election that I'm fully convinced that was rigged and stolen. Um, setting aside sort of the factual basis there, there's no evidence of widespread fraud in the 2020 election, let's say it again. It does seem to be a signal of a preemptive defense that Donald Trump's legal team may put up. What's your sense of how they may try to defend him here? Well, I think that this this is going to be something that you hear um, more and more, this idea that he didn't have the requisite corrupt intent. Now, I think other federal prosecutors who have tried cases like this will tell you that that just simply isn't required. And in this case, it just doesn't even really make any sense. Um, he had been told by any number of different people, including um, his own, people in his own party, his own attorney general at the time, um, Bill Barr, in, in addition to White House counsel, and any number of different court cases he had lost at the time, it was clear that he had lost the election. And so the idea that he somehow didn't know or wasn't aware just doesn't line up with the facts. Um, it's almost this idea of what you call willful blindness. But again, this is going to be an issue that's uh, litigated and contested. And ultimately, Hallie, if it gets that far, it's going to be for the jury to decide. There's also this question of, will anybody else end up caught up in this investigation, end up indicted here? We saw in the last indictment, and we're talking about it because it is kind of a reference point here, right? Special Counsel Jack Smith, part of his investigation. Donald Trump got this target letter. A few days later, his alleged co-conspirator, his body man, got a target letter. Do we know in this instance, Laura, yet if anybody else got a target letter? I know that's been a focus of our reporting. Yeah, Garrett and I and others on our team have been on the phone all day trying to figure that out. And so far, it does not appear that anyone else hmm. has. Um, you think about people like Steve Bannon, former senior advisor, Rudy Giuliani, uh, former President Trump's attorney, um, Cleta Mitchell, Bernard Carrick, John Eastman, the architect of the plan to overturn right. the 2020 election. Even he has not received a target letter thus far. Now, I should mention, just because you don't receive a target letter, doesn't mean that you're not a target or doesn't mean that you're not ultimately going to be indicted. It just means that they haven't received one, at least that they've told us uh, so far, which is notable, especially if, in fact, the former president is facing conspiracy charges. That needs two or more people to agree about something. That's right. OK, so listen, Garrett, we've been in, and I think appropriately, living a bit in the weeds here of what this means for Donald Trump. Bottom line is an indictment could come. It could come relatively soon. And if it does, it will come in the middle of a presidential campaign, which brings us to the political backdrop and the political context here. It has been interesting to me to see today a perhaps sharpening of tone from some but not all of the former president's Republican competitors here, like Nikki Haley, who said, listen, and I'm paraphrasing here, we, we're, we're dealing with a lot of drama. We don't need all this drama. We don't need all this distraction in this campaign. That's why you should vote for me. There's a question, of course, of what voters want, but let me play a little bit of what we heard from both her and Ron DeSantis, too. Watch. He should have come out more forcefully, of course that. But to try to criminalize that, that's a, diff that's a different issue entirely. We can't keep dealing with this drama. We can't keep dealing with the negativity. We can't keep dealing with all of this. All of that said, it has been consistent now for months that Republican primary voters have not pulled their support from Donald Trump despite the legal troubles against him. No, and Hallie, every indication I've gotten from talking to Republican voters is that they're not going to start now. I mean, Fair. what you just saw there were two um, what I would call post-Trump politicians trying to move the party past Trump without being anti-Trump. Those comments are calibrated to be as critical as you can be without turning off the 30 percent, perhaps, or more of the Republican Party who remain hardcore Trump faithful. And that's the box that all these candidates have really put themselves in. They have stipulated over months and months that they do think 
there's a weaponized justice system, that they do think that conservatives are unfairly targeted, and that they do think Donald Trump is unfairly targeted by prosecutors at the local, state, and federal level. They cannot now come back and say, oh, actually, this one's really serious, and the DOJ, who I've been hammering for months, along with the rest of the party, are now the good guys. So Donald Trump's uh, opponents have put themselves in a box that just makes it easier for him to continue to make the political argument that he's been making for going on seven years now, yeah. that he is a victim at all times, and he needs the rest of the party to support him. That's exactly what he's been saying today and exactly what he'll say going forward. And perhaps what he will say tonight at that Fox News town hall. Garrett Haig, Laura Jarrett, thank you both very much. I want to bring in Maura Barrett now, who's live for us in Chicago, because Maura, as we've laid out, part of this investigation by Jack Smith, we believe, is this look at so-called fake elector schemes. We talked about that a minute ago. You have some new reporting now just into us in the last hour or so on how Michigan is the latest state to be opening an investigation into one of those kinds of plots. Tell us more. Yeah, brand new developments in this, Hallie. The state's attorney general just announcing in the last hour what appears to be the first official charges when it comes to these fake elector schemes. Now, remember, technically in the U.S., a slate of electors from each state is who puts the president into office. And so the attorney general today of Michigan putting out a video laying out uh, the evidence that she sees against these 16 people who see, she says, quote, covertly met in the basement of the Michigan Republican Party's headquarters to uh, say that they were, in fact, the electors, even though Joe Biden had been, uh, the Democrats had been, who were officially selected by the voters of the state of Michigan, uh, to then put in place the qualified electors for the president and the vice president of the United States. Now, the attorney general said, quote, that was a lie. Uh, she said that they weren't the duly elected and qualified electors, and each one of those defendants knew that. I want to play you a part of her video announcement today, because as you mentioned, this does come against a political backdrop as we're coming up up against another election. Even though this is nearly three years in the past, it's something that we're going to continue talking about. And the attorney general uh, very much acknowledged that in, th in the announcement today. Undoubtedly, there will be those who claim these charges are political in nature. But where there is overwhelming evidence of guilt in respect to multiple crimes, the most political act I could engage in as a prosecutor would be to take no action at all. Now, 16 people in this case have been charged, eight counts each of various uh, felony counts of forgery and conspiracy uh, to commit election law forgery. And so this is something that we're going to see play out over the next couple of days, because as we've heard from some of these alleged electors in the past, these fake electors, they said that they didn't even necessarily know what they were signing. So this is something that's going to continue to play out in Michigan, but also likely in other states. I want to show you briefly, uh, there are several other states where we saw uh, this replicated Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, New Mexico, Nevada, Pennsylvania, uh, and Wisconsin. So while this is the first of a, an apparent line of charges we'll see from Michigan, this definitely isn't the last, Hallie. Maura Barrett, thank you for being all over that one. Appreciate it. Tonight, some new and urgent warnings around the world about the risk of heart attacks, even death, as heat waves are gripping both the U.S. and Europe, especially because the lows, they are not very low at all. Look at Phoenix, where the coldest it's getting in the middle of the night is above 90 degrees. It's been like that for nine straight days. The highs have been above 110 for two and a half weeks, so the longest streak there ever. In Europe, you have red alerts, they call them. Look at this, in the south and in the east, including at a lot of popular tourist sites, like at the Colosseum. Sicily and Sardinia any day now could hit 118 degrees. That's close to the hottest day ever for all of Europe with the heat making it harder to fight wildfires that are burning out of control in Greece, Spain, and Switzerland. Claudio Lavagna has more from Rome. Well, today, the temperature in Rome reached 107 degrees Fahrenheit. That is officially the hottest temperature ever recorded uh, in this city, and the impact is in front of everybody's eyes. Now, this is one of the uh, most popular squares in the whole of Rome, and usually it's full of people, especially at this time of the day. And at this time of the year, it's the peak of the tourist season. And as you can see, there's barely anybody, apart from the odd tourist uh, that is filling up bottles and uh, freshen up a bit, and that one of the many uh, drinkable water fountains that are dotted uh, around the city. And talking about tourists, we spoke today uh, to the head of the uh, civil, uh, civil Protection Agency here uh, in Rome, 
who told us that today, because it was the hottest day of the year, it was expected to be, um, they deployed tens of volunteers called the Angeli del Freddo, or the Angels of Freshness, freshness um, uh, ready to hand out bottles or help out tourists as well as citizens who um, found it difficult to cope with this kind of uh, heat wave. And he told NBC News that uh, most people, the vast majority of people they had to help were tourists because he said that the Italians listened to the advice, they stayed home in the hottest hours of the day, but perhaps the tourists, because they have a limited time, they didn't want to uh, shorten or ruin uh, their holidays, so they were out and about. Now, uh, he said that many were unprepared. Uh, they, were, they had no water, they uh, were not wearing a hat, uh, and and about 11 uh, people either fainted or fell ill uh, because of the heat wave. And this is just the volunteers from the Civil Protection Agency. He said that probably uh, the emergency services helped a lot uh, more uh, people than that. Now, there's also a different kind of uh, impacts of this uh, heat wave. Uh, for instance, the rock band Muse, uh, which is uh, playing here at the stadium in Rome uh, tonight, uh, they were so concerned about the health of fans having to spend many hours uh, in this heat that they moved uh, their concert to later in the day. And they even advised or warned their fans on social media uh, not to show up too early at their concert. Well, not very rock and roll. Claudio Lavagna, our thanks to him for that reporting from Rome. So listen, we have got some breaking news on a story tonight giving us some clues on why an American soldier stationed in South Korea apparently ran across the border, broke away into North Korea. We're learning his identity in literally the, the last five minutes, I mean, since we've been on the air. Um, he is now detained here. We're going to get to that in a second. The circumstances are very murky. He's been identified by a U.S. Army spokesperson as Private Second Class Travis King. He was on his way home, apparently facing disciplinary actions back here in the U.S. That is, until Private King apparently joined a tour of the DMZ. That's the area you see here. And then bolted across the border. Private tours happen in this location, this kind of village on the border all the time. You probably remember seeing it from this when former President Trump and North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un met for a photo op right at the DMZ in 2019. It, the, the line there of demarcation, the area, is only about 30 miles from Seoul, where the Korean armistice agreement was signed, pausing, not ending, the war between the two countries. NBC's Andrea Mitchell is covering this one for us. And Andrea, again, lots of murkiness around it, but also some new information coming in um, about what in the world happened here. What do we know and where does this go? Hallie, it is such an unusual story, but this private, this army private, who had been detained and punished for an infraction of the special security agreement yeah, with South gotcha. Korea. He had already been punished. He was being escorted by the military to the commercial airport, Incheon Airport, uh, which is, oh, I'm told about 60, 70 kilometers from the DMZ, so an hour and a half bus ride. And so they escorted him. He was not in handcuffs. He was not under military police. He had served his time over there for whatever punishment this was. We don't know the infraction. And uh, they took him to the commercial security checkpoint, and that's where they apparently left him. They couldn't take him to the gate. And after that, he left, attached himself to a commercial, you know, travel group <laughs> and rode by bus, apparently, to the DMZ, to, to Pyongyang, or rather to um, Panmunjom, that village there, right in the middle of the DMZ. Uh, you saw, you know, Donald Trump step across the demarcation line. I've been there several times. And it is literally the South Korean soldiers facing the North Korean soldiers face to face. You're told, don't raise your arm, don't blink, don't give eye contact. They could take it as a sign of aggression. So it's that tense. It's still a hostile place between the two. And then there is, of course, the long demilitarized zone, the no man's land. And he bolted, according to a senior administration official talking to me today, he bolted is in North Korean custody. So uh, the U.S. communicated to the North Koreans and told them that this was, you know, a will willful act, not an aggressive act. They got a response confirming the receipt of that message. And as a last report, no further communication. What are we hearing from the defense secretary about this, Andrea? Uh, just the basic facts. They were withholding the name until they notified his family. So. He is going to have to face whatever military action, uh, disciplinary action back here in the U.S. But in the meantime, uh, they, of course, want to get him back. 
and now he's in the custody of the North Koreans. And this mm. gives them some leverage in a situation where we've had almost zero communication with them. Uh, for two years now, the Biden administration trying to communicate on these serious nuclear issues, no response, no agreement to negotiate. And meanwhile, they've escalated in their nuclear, uh, the nuclear program has gone, uh, escalated beyond all measure. They now have submarine launch missiles. They've got long range missiles, ICBMs that can reach the continental United States. They are threatening U.S., South Korean, and Japanese forces. And we have continued hostility with North Korea. Hallie? Andrea Mitchell, live for us uh, from Aspen on that. Andrea, thank you so much. It's good to see you. Appreciate it. You Back here at home, Pennsylvania police tonight say their search for two little kids swept away by a flash flood may shift soon from a rescue on the ground to a recovery in the water if they don't find these children tonight. Listen. That will mean underwater assets, mainly in the creek, and we will work out from there. We are going to begin to scale down for the land has been covered and it has all been tracked by GPS. This is day four of that desperate search in Bucks County. You can see it's right there along the Delaware River. A bunch of nearby roads have been closed so searchers can cover more ground faster. But potentially complicating this whole operation, crews are bracing for more rain and maybe more flash flooding toward the end of the week after this area just got hammered by it earlier. Emily Aketa is joining us now. What's the latest, Emily? Hey there, Hallie. Well, today really was the firmest acknowledgement from authorities so far that this is indeed a recovery mission. Police say that they are searching for, quote, two missing angels. Of course, two-year-old mm. Maddie Shields and her younger brother, nine-month-old Conrad, they went missing, swept away in the massive floodwaters over the weekend in Bucks County. And authorities say they have searched the flood zone. It's about a one-and-a-half-mile stretch in Bucks County more than a dozen times. We've talked about the whole host of resources they've been using, drones, dogs, boats, people on foot. Well, at the end of the day, if they still have not found those two young children, as you mentioned, they will be shifting their focus a bit. They will be focusing on the water, specifically the creeks in that area. Remember, this is an area that is prone to flooding, not just because of the nearby Delaware River, but all of those narrow creeks weaving throughout the town of Washington Crossing. There were at least a dozen vehicles that have been trapped in the flash flooding over the weekend. Uh, just because of the suddenness of the raging water. Uh, they're reminding people to stay away as they continue their search process, especially as they go into the water using dive rescue teams. They'll continue to use cadaver dogs as well. Um, in addition to 32-year-old Katie Seely and presumably her two young children, four others also died, ranging in age from 32 to 78 years old. Hallie. Emily Aketa, thank you very much for the update. I know you'll keep us posted. New stunning allegations tonight coming into us that Texas officials have been given orders to push migrant kids and others back into the river at the border. But the state trooper calling it inhumane that those migrants are apparently not being given water, alleging that some of them, including a four year old girl, are getting hurt on razor wire with one woman allegedly stuck on the wire while suffering a miscarriage. That's according to internal emails. You can see them right here obtained by NBC News and first reported by The Houston Chronicle. A senior Customs and Border Protection official tells our team that wire hung by Texas DPS, the Texas Department of Public Safety, you can see it here, it's called concertina wire. They say it is hurting migrants, which is why the Border Patrol is doing more to try to help. Now, a spokesperson for the Texas DPS tells NBC News the allegations this particular trooper is making are, in their words, outrageous. We are also hearing more from those state officials, Operation Lone Star. That's the operation from Governor Greg Abbott to try to stop illegal immigration. They are also pushing back on these allegations. Julia Ainsley is covering this one for us tonight, um, and it is extraordinary. What is being alleged by this state trooper here uh, of the way that some of these migrant children and babies um, and, and people coming across are being treated. Yeah, it's unbelievable. This is one of their own, someone from within their ranks. As we know, in Texas, under this Operation Lone Star, started in 2021 by Governor Greg Abbott, he moved some people who have never seen the border down to the border. One of those people saw some things that he just couldn't keep to himself, and he sent an email internally to Texas DPS that's now been obtained by the Houston Chronicle and by us, where he details some things, like the four-year-old who was passing out from exhaustion and not given water, like a man who had to tear his child off 
off of that razor sharp concertina wire. I've seen it being hung. It was definitely being built up right around the lifting of Title 42 in May. Now, DHS is weighing in on this, even though they're the federal The federal agency, here. to be clear. This is if there's a distinction between what's happening at the state level, it seems, and federal. And that's really what tells this whole story, because usually immigration's a federal issue. But Greg Abbott wanted to make it a state issue, and that's when he began this operation. And they said, look, CBP actually does have some problems with this because it impedes their operations when they have to go in and rescue. And in a statement, they said, this report is troubling if true. It is cruel and inhumane, and we can both enforce our laws and treat human beings with dignity. We mentioned that new statement from Operation Lone Star. It's more pushback, right? Yeah, they're saying, look, this is outrageous. We've issued no orders or directions that would compromise human lives. So when they're I, saying they didn't order people and babies and kids to be pushed back into the river. They're saying be, we didn't do that. Yeah, let's talk about what orders mean. Yes. Here. So there was never a memo that went out that said, hey, keep all the babies out and don't give anybody water. But according to this person who was down there, this trooper who witnessed it firsthand, he was ordered by other people mm. within Texas DPS not to administer that. Now, when I got on the phone with Texas DPS today, they said, look, if we give water to everybody, they're just going to want to keep coming across the river. We'll step in when we think it's a medical emergency, and we urge our state troopers to use common sense. But, you know, the line can get gray there, and it can get dangerous. Where does this go? In other words, is there going to be an investigation? Do the, does the federal agency have any sort of jurisdiction to come and oversee Operation Lone Star? It is, a, like I said, it's a little bit murky here because of the federal versus state distinction. About who could step in and yeah. who could actually claim harm. We often see states suing the federal government over their policies. Perhaps we would see this go the other way if it got to that point. Julia Ainsley, thank you so much for that. Appreciate you bringing us that reporting. And breaking in just the last hour, we are learning that Las Vegas police have searched a home in connection to the murder of Tupac, a murder that's gone unsolved for nearly 30 years. He died, remember, at the age of 25 after being shot in a drive-by in Vegas. You're looking at some of that old footage here. I, I don't have to tell you that Tupac Shakur, mega huge rap star. A short but legendary career. He sold tens of millions of records worldwide, most of that coming after his death. There has never been an arrest in the case, and police say this new search now just the last 24 hours in Vegas is part of an investigation even all these years later into his death. Noah Pransky is joining us now. What else do we know? And does it signal that maybe police are getting closer to solving this, this mystery that's been out there for years of who killed Tupac? Well, I don't want to speculate, but the, the statement you just read is about all we're getting from police at this point. We do know it took place in Henderson, Nevada, which is a suburb not too far uh, from the center of Las Vegas, uh, southeastern corner of, of the Las Vegas area. Uh, police looked at this place last night, but we still don't have many new details today. Uh, as you mentioned, this case has been going on for 20-something years, unsolved, but in Nevada, there is no statute of limitations on homicides. So police have apparently been continuing to look. Um, it seems like maybe there was something, some new lead. And Hallie, you know, you look back, there were a lot of police involved in this from Nevada, New York, California. We, we were talking about East Coast, West Coast rivalries, gang violence. There was a lot of reasons that maybe this case never got solved, but I'm, I'm sure a lot of folks crossing their fingers today. You, you know, I, I, I feel like we would be remiss not to talk about, when you talk about the death of Tupac, the conspiracy theories that have surrounded his death, too. There's been this whole thing, like, is Tupac still alive, et cetera. Um, I, I can only imagine that this search from Vegas police could reignite some of that talk. Yeah, he's out on a beach chilling with Elvis and some of those other mysteries. But the conspiracies um, are prevalent on this case. Um, there's a lot of talk about that he survived the shooting. He survived this assassination plot. Uh, a lot of people believe he has been hiding all these years in Cuba or Malaysia. His family, his old bodyguards, record executives, they've all leaned into this. And the end result is that it sells a lot of Tupac records. So mm. we'll see what this does. But I'll tell you one thing. You can expect Tupac songs that jump up the list this week. Lots of questions on this one. Let's see if we get any more from Vegas PD. Noah Pransky, thank you very much. Yeah. Coming up here on the show, police in Oregon say multiple deaths near Portland are linked. Just weeks after telling people not to speculate about a serial killer. We'll tell you how the families of some of these victims are reacting. Plus, what officers say they found when they searched the murder suspect's home in those Gilgo Beach serial killings. That's in the five things. Investigators in Oregon say they now have a person of interest in the deaths of four women in that area, deaths that appear to be linked, they say. 
Even though it was weeks ago, the Portland police told people to stop speculating about a possible serial killer. Now, right now, they say there's no threat to the community. As we're showing you here, the victims, Ashley Rial, Kristen Smith, Charity Perry, Bridget Webster. Police are also looking into the deaths of two other women, which could be connected. Here's Stephen Romo with more. Yeah, hey, Holly, six women were discovered dead between February and May, all within the same 100-mile area around Portland. Now, that sparked fears about a serial killer. That's a term law enforcement has not used. In fact, police had said previously these cases weren't connected. But they're now saying they believe four of those deaths may, in fact, be linked. Take a look at this timeline. 22-year-old Kristen Smith was found dead in February. 24-year-old Charity Perry was found two months later in April. Then days later, 31-year-old Bridget Webster was also found dead. Just a week oh, after that, a little more than a week after that, another victim, Ashley Rial, was found dead on May 7th. Another case in that same time span was an unidentified woman. Police later said foul play was not suspected there, but yet another case, 32-year-old Joanna Speaks, was also found dead in April. Investigators have not indicated that Speaks is connected to the other four, but her family is holding out hope for answers, saying in a statement yesterday, quote, we are in direct communication with our detective to verify why our sister's name has not been linked to the person of interest along with the four other girls as of this morning. We're extremely thankful, however, that we are one step closer to getting answers for the families. Charity Perry's mom also spoke with our affiliate KGW about the anguish they're experiencing. I'm doing better than I was the, the, the first week. Uh, I, I got my blood pre pressure a little more under control. The DA's office points out no charges have been filed against anyone in these cases, but they say they do have a person of interest connected to these four cases of Smith, Perry, Webster, and Rial. Now, they have not released much information about that person. They do, however, say they don't believe there is any active danger to the community right now. Hallie? Our thanks to Stephen Romo for that. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, police say the suspect in the Gilgo Beach serial killings had more than 200 guns at home. Describing it as an arsenal, essentially, in a vault, they're trying to figure out now if those guns were legally registered. The police spokesperson says that's about all they're sharing about what was seized. Nothing much more from them. Number two, Illinois could be the first state to end cash bail after its Supreme Court today said its plan to get rid of it does not violate the state constitution. So this change means it's up to a judge to decide whether or not a person is going to be detained while they wait for trial, set to take effect in a couple of months. Number three, retail sales ticked up a little bit last month, according to the Commerce Department. It wasn't quite as much as sales went up in April and May, but experts say it shows, hey, people are still getting out there and spending money, especially at electronic stores and furniture stores. Folks are spending a little less, it seems, at grocery stores and at gas stations. Number four, Britney Spears set to come out with a new song Friday with the rapper Will I Am. It's called Mind Your Business. It's the second song she's put out since her conservatorship ended. It also comes after she said her memoir called The Woman in Me is set to be released this October. Number five, <laughs> our daily Powerball update for all of you. We are your home for all news lotto all the time. But this is really newsy because it's at like a billion dollars. That is a lot of money. Nobody won last night, so tomorrow the jackpot's set to be the seventh highest ever in the U.S. and the third highest for Powerball itself. Good luck. You're probably not going to win. Dare to dream. Let's take you out west now, where your double-double animal style is going to be served up a little bit differently. Why? Because one of the country's most popular burger chains is telling some of its workers they are not going to be allowed to wear masks unless they have a doctor's note. They are banning masks. In and Out says it's because they want customers to be able to see the smiles on workers' faces. And if those staffers do not comply, they could be fired. Now, this applies most states where in and out operates. You know they're not in the East Coast, the states you see here. It does not apply, interestingly, in California and Oregon because banning masks is not allowed. In those states, workers are going to have to wear company-approved masks if they want to wear them. The CDC, remember, says 60% of people in this country have a chronic condition that makes them more at risk for getting COVID. Everybody has their own unique situation. Some people have pre-existing medical conditions. Um, some people have, may have uh, family members at home who are high risk and they don't want to bring anything home with them. So if people want to wear masks, we should let them wear masks. 
Um, Investopedia editor in chief Caleb Silver is joining us now. What? It felt like the whole mass debate was over. People were kind of doing like a live and let live thing. It, uh, is serving a burger with a smile, I guess, in and out is making the decision that that's important, important to their bottom line? Yeah, and they want clear and effective communication between their customers and their associates. Like, I want a double burger with cheese and those animal fries. Want to make sure we can hear that. But this is a company sort of enforcing its own mandates on its employees. It's a privately held company. It can do this. They, they're allowed to do it. That's they legally can, allowed, yes. Right, and they can fire employees if they do not obey. Um, this is not the first time that we've seen In-N-Out make some decisions around COVID um, that have had some pushback here. When the vaccine mandates came into play in California, the company opposed that. Um, they're a big donor to the Republican Party in that state. They also are known for stamping Bible verses on some of the packaging here. From a business perspective, is this business mixed with a side of politics, in your view? I think so, and also some ideology. These, this is a company that has been privately held for years, since 1948 or so. It is run by a billionaire. She is Lindsay Snyder. She's the grandchild of Harry and Esther Snyder. Very religious family. She is very religious. She's been outspoken about that. So you can get John 316 inside of every uh, cup. You can get Proverbs 24, 16 on your fries, Luke 635 on coffee cups. This is their agenda. It doesn't affect their business. Again, a privately held company that's super popular and has a pretty big fan base. Well, that's my question. It's, will it affect their business? Because California is a liberal state, right? Like, California is also a place, and I say California because In-N-Out has a billion burger joints in California. It's also a state where people love their In-N-Out. You know what I mean? So do we think there's going to be any pushback? What's the reaction been so far from customers, from people who love In-N-Out? Well, it's funny because the outcry is on both sides. There are people supporting the decision by In-N-Out, and there are people opposing it, as you might expect. So I don't think it's going to hurt their business at all. People that like In-N-Out like In-N-Out. They're going to go for those animal fries and that double burger. That's what they want. That's what they're going to get, and the company can do whatever it wants. It's privately held. Caleb Silver, thank you so much. It's good to see you good here to on see set. You. When we come back, we'll take it live to South Carolina, where Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is laying out his plan to change the military. He says it's too woke. We've got a live report. Plus, later, officials in Illinois say a 10-year-old was badly hurt after getting thrown from a carnival ride. But we're hearing about potential criminal charges in the local. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis tonight taking his culture wars, as they call it, to the military, laying out a plan to go after, in his words, the woke mind virus inside the armed forces. Listen to how he's framing it over on CNN in just the last hour. I think you've had a big problem uh, with morale. You clearly have a problem with recruiting. And at this levels, everybody has acknowledged these recruiting levels are at a crisis. Why is that the case? I think it's because people see the military losing its way, not focusing on the mission and focusing on a lot of these other things. It's all coming as DeSantis becomes the first Republican candidate. You see him here registering for the South Carolina primary. This is him earlier today. One of the first primaries on the calendar and a race that could boost or doom a campaign. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez is traveling with the governor in Columbia, South Carolina. So let's talk about the woke mind virus, as DeSantis alleges. He has made this sort of anti-woke agenda a huge focus of his campaign, but it's a campaign that has had some stumbles that is stagnating in the polls, for example. He's still putting his eggs in the anti-woke basket, clearly. Yeah, clearly, Hallie, and look, that a phrase, woke, he uses it to describe a lot of things, talking about education, now talking about the military, he rolled out his immigration policy a few weeks ago, mentioned it there, and also there's this back and forth over insurance in Florida, and the word woke keeps coming up over and over again. Now, the governor today rolled out that military plan, it was of course overshadowed by much of the Trump news, but let's tick through that military plan, if we can throw up a full screen of what some of it is. It includes eliminating DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion programs in the military, banning government buildings from flying any flag other than the U.S. Uh, U.S. flag or the U.S. military, revoking an order allowing transgender personnel to serve as their preferred sex, banning taxpayer funds for sex changes, hormones, or gender surgeries, banning drag shows on bases, and reinstating soldiers discharged for not getting vaccinated also ending climate change programs. So, Hallie, those are just some of the things that Governor DeSantis laid out today, and he spoke about it earlier at an event at a veterans hall. Take a listen. 
Right now, the military is using your tax dollars to pay for hormones and sex change operations for people in the military. Look, I, I, not my cup of tea. I, I don't think any tax dollars should ever go to that. And so, Hallie, this is all part of a strategy, too, where he's highlighting his military service. Of course, he served as a Navy uh, JAG lawyer back uh, in Iraq, and he's hoping that that may gain him some traction as well as the so-called woke mind virus with GOP primary voters here in South Carolina, Hallie. You talk about South Carolina. Uh, it's circled on my calendar. It is like marked on the GCAL there because it comes after Iowa and New Hampshire and I think right. maybe Nevada this, uh, Nevada this year had a Super Tuesday. Um, what's so interesting about DeSantis going to South Carolina and kind of planting his flag there is not just the competition he faces in the state from people who know that state well. I'm thinking of Senator Tim Scott, for example, obviously Nikki Haley, um, but the way that it feels like perhaps him trying to take out an insurance policy in case his showing in Iowa and New Hampshire isn't as strong as he'd hoped. Sure, it, it could be a key uh, state, of course, and he is the first candidate to file in the uh, South Carolina GOP primary, even ahead of Nikki Haley and Tim Scott. So clearly his campaign views it as a huge deal, especially because there will be more time in between those first primaries in South Carolina this time. So he expects to spend more time here. But Halley, Iowa is still key for this campaign. His campaign sent, sending a lot of resources to Iowa, and if he doesn't have a strong showing there, the question might be at that point, will he even get to South Carolina, especially since his campaign is burning through so much cash in these early few weeks, Hallie. Gabe Gutierrez live for us there in Columbia traveling with Governor DeSantis. Thank you, Gabe. Coming up, an NBC News exclusive with the parents of that woman in Alabama who went missing say about the moments their daughter showed up on their doorstep 48 hours later. Plus, new dash cam video. Look at this, showing an Amtrak train slamming into a semi. Ooh, yikes. That's later in the local. To a new exclusive interview you will only see here on NBC News. The parents of that woman in Alabama who went missing telling us now that she fought for her life, physically and mentally, before she made it to her doorstep. Listen. We tried to hug her as best we could, but I had to stand back because she was not in a good state. So we had to stand back and let medical let professionals work with her. her. Um, but yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Incredibly emotional, of course, for the parents of Carly Russell, who disappeared Thursday, not long after calling 911 to report a toddler walking alone on the highway. When officers got there, there was no sign of Russell or the child. But on Saturday night, she showed up, as you just heard, at her parents' front door. The parents tell NBC News they cannot share details about how Carly made it home or what she says happened while she was missing because of the ongoing investigation. But they say that their daughter was abducted. They think that whoever did it is still out there. Priscilla Thompson is joining us now. And Priscilla, um, it, it is just an in incredible exclusive. And thank you for speaking to her parents. Tell us more about what they're telling you. Yeah, Hallie, they described the joy they felt when they first saw her show up on their doorstep. But then you heard her mother saying that she wanted to give her a hug, but she saw that she wasn't in a good state. And so ultimately they had medics transport her to the hospital. And I asked the parents about those hours and days after she came home from the hospital. And they said that first night that she asked to sleep with them in the bed, she didn't even want to sleep by herself, that she has been experiencing uh, nightmares and she is easily triggered is what they are saying. And they're also concerned about the speculation that has been happening on social media as questions are growing about uh, how all of this happened and where exactly she was and what happened. And they are saying that uh, Carly has seen some of those things and it's been very upsetting for her. And so they're asking people to let this investigation play out. And I also asked them about the statement that was made by her boyfriend that she had been fighting for her life life for 48 hours and I want to play a bit of that exchange do you believe she was fighting for her life oh, she definitely fought for her life. there were moments when she physically had to fight for her life and there were moments when she had to mentally fight for her life but she made it back to you she, she made, made it back. back and that's all that matters 
And one of the most emotional points of that interview is when they talked about those 48 hours when they were searching for their daughter and they said that they would receive hoax phone calls that people would text and call claiming to be Carly and they would get their hopes up even going to a hotel to search for her and ultimately it wasn't her but thankfully they are so happy to have her back with them now. Hallie? What else do we know from police about this investigation? There are still a lot of questions here, Priscilla. Like, are they still looking for a, for a toddler, the one that Carly Russell allegedly says she saw? Do we know anything more? Yeah, that is the big question. They are declining to say. What we know is that they are analyzing that initial 911 call, that uh, traffic video showing the car with the hazard, light, hazard lights on on the interstate around the time that she disappeared. They're also analyzing all the things they found at the crime scene, the car, her purse, her cell phone, all of that. And the police chief telling me that the public deserves to know what happened and he does intend to share that information once this investigation concludes. Hallie? Priscilla Thompson live for us there in Hoover, Alabama. Priscilla, thank you. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Midwest Bureau, officials in Illinois say a 10-year-old boy was hurt pretty significantly after getting thrown off a carnival ride. The fire chief says they think he fell like 15 or 20 feet, just so scary. Police and fire and investigators from the state labor department are all looking into what went wrong here. There could be criminal charges to come down, they think. Out of our Southern Bureau, look at this dash cam video. An Amtrak train going through Florida crashes, oof, right there. You can see it in the highlighted part on your screen, crashes into like a tractor trailer. The truck was just stopped on the tracks. Police say they don't know why. Officials say nearly 200 people were on board the train at the time. Seven of them were hurt, although fortunately not seriously. And out of our Western Bureau, Colorado wildlife officials say they saved a bear cub after it got stuck while dumpster diving. There, there's a little bear going to look for some food, got a little stuck in the trash. See that chain link fence? Officials put that in there so the bear could escape. So there it is, climbing out, dropping down, taking a big jump, going back to its mama. Fortunately, reunited. Still to come, messy mania building in Miami. What fellow legend and team owner David Beckham is telling our Guad Venegas about Messi's impact and legacy and what they hope he brings to the club. Coming up. Messi mania, we're talking about it because little Messi today was taking the field for his first practice with Inter Miami. Not even a game, man, we're talking about practice. We're talking about practice. It's not even a game. Full-blown fireworks show Sunday. And then this, right? Just one of the guys. There he is taking a little warm-up jog around the field. Cameras were allowed to get in there for at least a little bit. He did some drills. Not like the guy needs to drill. He's a legend, but he did. Somebody else who's a legend, David Beckham, who's a co-owner of Inter Miami, was on the sidelines to check everything out. He talked today about what Messi could teach his teammates. Listen. They see... Leo turn up earlier than they're turning up. They mm -hmm. see him leave later than they leave. Mm -hmm. They see him doing the right things, you know, the way he works. These are professional players that have played at the top level and won everything that you can in the game. So our young players can only learn from those moments. Guad Venegas is joining us now. Guad, you had a chance to go one-on-one -on -one with David Beckham on all things Messi, all things soccer, all things sort of bananas town about Messi's appearance in Miami because people are going nuts there. Tell us more. Well, Hallie, Beckham, uh, not only is he a co-owner, but he came to the United States years ago the way Messi did when he was uh, towards the end of his prime, but he was still playing very well, came to the LA Galaxy, and he saw what it was like coming to this country and going through those changes. This league is very different than the leagues in Europe, and of course, it takes some getting used to. So we wanted to know uh, what David Beckham thought about Messi getting used to playing here. Here's part of uh, what Beckham said. It doesn't matter who you are and how good you are, you need, to, you need time to adapt to, you know, the, the, the surface, to, to your teammates, um, and obviously to a different league as well. So he needs to be given time. It doesn't matter whether it's uh, Lionel Messi. He needs to be given time to adapt. 
We should also add the humidity for anyone that comes to South Florida and begins playing in this weather. It has to be tough. In fact, we're under the extreme heat uh, weather warning here. And when they warmed up this morning, we were there to watch that. Uh, after about 10 minutes, they gave them a water break. So all of these things will get time getting used to. Of course, you know, soccer is a sport where you have 11 players on the field. So Messi will have to get to know the players on the team, the way the team is going to be playing Major League Soccer. So it's a lot of changes. So Beckham hasn't made any promises that we're going to see a change right away on the field because, as he said, it's going to take some time for Messi to get used to things. Uh, we don't even know. He didn't assure us that Messi is going to be playing on Friday. This is going to be the first game where Messi is on the team, but we'll have to wait and see what the coach decides. Uh, what Beckham essentially wanted to make well, sure people second, understand is that this second, is going to be gradual. Second. Are you telling me that Messi may be on the team but not actually take to the field on Friday night when people are paying hundreds of dollars to go to see Messi's first game? Well, most likely what's going to happen, if you ask me, Hallie, they'll probably put him into the game at of some course. point, maybe in the second half. That's that's usually what happens in soccer when you have, even if it's a start. Now, he could be playing the entire game, you know, but but that's a decision, of course, for the, for the coach to make. But when Beckham was asked... He said, well, we're going to wait and see. But, you know, he has to give the coach the power to make that decision. That's, yeah. I, I mean, I guess that's just how soccer works, right? When you have a new player, they have to get used to the team. If you ask me, Hallie, I think what's going to happen is he's probably going to come in as a substitute uh, at some point during the game. Because, as you're right, like, fans are coming to see Messi play on Friday. Um, Guad Venegas, thank you. We'll talk again, I know, in just a little bit. Appreciate it, friend. That's a wrap for this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. We are coming on the air with breaking news on multiple fronts, starting with the clock ticking for former President Trump. Now that he is a target of the special counsel's investigation into a scheme to interfere with the 2020 election, what this means for another potential indictment, the timing, and the new reaction you may not expect from his political rivals. Also new in just the last few minutes, we are getting even more details coming into us about that U.S. soldier who apparently ran across the North Korean border and is now in their custody. The new reaction tonight from the defense secretary and what the U.S. is doing to get him home. Plus, in just the last hour, a new twist in the mystery of who murdered legendary rapper Tupac Shakur. Well, we're just hearing from Las Vegas police about a new search. Then we'll take you to Rome, a city having its hottest day ever, as we're just hearing the power grid in Texas is getting pushed to the brink for a second day in a row. Plus, your double-double animal style served up maybe a little differently. Why everybody's favorite West Coast burger chain is now banning employees from wearing masks. More on that in and out controversy later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and in the next couple of hours, we may hear from former President Trump at a town hall for the first time about the fact that he is almost certainly going to be arrested again on federal charges, according to legal experts. Why do they think that? Well, Mr. Trump's attorneys now have what's called a target letter from special counsel Jack Smith as part of his investigation into a scheme to overturn the legitimate results of the 2020 election. How do we know that Donald Trump has a target letter? Donald Trump told us he scooped it on his own platform in a Truth Social post calling Jack Smith deranged, acknowledging that he's a target, and saying these letters almost always mean an arrest and indictment. That's true, by the way. If this sounds familiar, it's because it is. Mr. Trump also got a target letter, the last indictment, essentially, over a different part of the special counsel's investigation into those classified documents found at Mar-a-Lago. That letter came on May 19th, 20 days later. Mr. Trump was indicted on three dozen federal charges. So we can't stress this enough. The clock now seems to be ticking. And we have a pretty good idea of what the special counsel is looking into alleged plots by Mr. Trump and his inner circle to keep him in power. Specifically, plans to create sets of so-called fake electors, basically people in several key swing states who would go against what voters wanted to pick Mr. Trump instead of President Biden, who legitimately won. All of it leading up to the attack on the Capitol by Trump supporters on January 6th. Again, part of a push to try to get Donald Trump to stay in power based on election fraud lies. Now, here's what we don't know. We don't know for sure what Mr. Trump could be charged with. Could it be the stuff related to the attack on the Capitol? Could it be something about a fake elector scheme or something else? We don't know. But we can say that experts see this case as potentially the most serious legally against Mr. Trump, all part of a web of legal issues. It also includes charges in New York on the state level. He's already been indicted there. The classified documents situation, he's already been indicted there. 
and what may come down in Georgia also related to election interference. That could happen in the first couple of weeks of August. All of it is building as his political allies, like House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, are defending him. Watch. I think the American public is tired of this. They want to have see equal justice, and the idea that they utilize this to go after those who politically disagree with them is wrong. We've got team coverage tonight, including NBC News correspondent Maura Barrett joining us with an investigation out of Michigan, Vaughn Hilliard with campaign coverage, and Laura Jarrett on the legal analysis. So, Vaughn, let me start with you here. Uh, and it is possible Donald Trump has a Fox News town hall later tonight. You have to think he's going to be asked about all this. I imagine we will hear much of what we've already heard from him on his online platform, right, talking about how he sees himself as a victim of political persecution here. We should ex expect him to play uh, political offense, you know, at the same time that his uh, legal defense counsel is going to be looking at, number one, the ways to respond to uh, this letter that Donald Trump is uh, a target of the special counsel's investigation, but also the question of whether he will go before that grand jury if, in fact, it's true that he was invited to go testify. Uh, there is the political end of this. And for Donald Trump, you know, he has talked about over the last year, if he were to get back Back into the White House about potentially pardoning uh, the mass share of January 6 defendants. There is the reality that he could be a January 6 defendant himself next. And one way to uh, potentially guarantee his freedom, if he were to be found guilty of any charges that were be brought against him, were to uh, potentially pardon himself. And so there is a lot on the line for him politically here. And we should expect, like he has had ever since January 6, try to take this on politically and at least convince the mass share of the Republican electorate that he was uh, in the right in the uh, weeks after the 2020 election and that he was not directly uh, uh, um, uh, the cause of the actual violence that took uh, place at the Capitol that day. Laura, let me go to you on this. Um, it was three weeks, roughly, between the time Donald Trump got a target letter in the last sort of go round here versus yep. when he actually ended up indicted. Do we, th and I don't know if we have a, a clue as to the answer here, do we think that might be similar this time around? In other words, now that he has the target letter, he suggested he had something like four days to respond, et cetera. Do we think it could come this week, next week, August? Do we know? The real answer is we need more reporting on it, Hallie. I, I think it's fair to say that it's imminent uh, and that we are reaching sort of the end days in stages, however we think is best to put it, but may not necessarily come this week. Um, obviously, this is a, a very significant development. Again, we've all kind of been living through this, but this is the former president of the United States being indicted for trying to steal the last election while he is running to be the next president of the United States. That's never happened before. Um, and certainly they want to be very careful about this as they realize they probably only have one shot to get this right, Hallie. Um, the, the legal piece of this, Laura, let me stick with you for one second here. Do we have any sense of how the former president's team is going to look to defend him legally here? I'm not talking about politically. Yeah. I could list 17 ways that I think Donald Trump will try to politically defend himself. Vaughn could too. But I'm talking about in a court of law, what would be his defense? Can we even speculate on that since we don't know what potential charges he could face? You, we can speculate on it because we've sort of seen how they've already been planting the seeds of it. And the way that it sort of works is to say, look, I genuinely believe the election was rigged and stolen, even though there is an immense amount of evidence to the contrary. Um, and so because I genuinely believe that, who could fault me for trying to make sure that I vigorously defended um, the rights of all of my supporters to try to stay in office? Now, the pushback to that, of course, that you will hear from federal prosecutors is it's one thing to have a genuine faith belief. It's quite another to use illegal means to try to carry out that um, to try to carry out that project. So you can file court cases, you can do legitimate things like that, but you can't unleash a mob on the Capitol right. to take siege on the Capitol in, in that type of way. But that's the, I think the kind of argument you're going to hear is that he was vigorously defending his right to stay in office and that he genuinely believed the election was stolen. And so all of the things that we saw in terms of phony electors, all of those efforts were because he actually believed it was so. Again, we don't know what evidence prosecutors have on the other side of that to say maybe perhaps he told people he knew he lost. Uh, Vaughn, let me go to you here because there is a political backdrop too. I am struck by, given what Laura has laid out on the potential timeline here, and we don't know when it could come, it may, we know that um, in, down in Georgia there is another outstanding investigation he faces um, 
on election interference. It sounds like, from what we've heard from the woman leading that investigation, she will make a decision in sometime in the first couple weeks of August. We could get, right around the same time, an indictment in Georgia and an indictment federally on the special counsel case about a week and a half, maybe, before the first Republican primary debate, Vaughn, right? I mean, this is all, it is all building um, in a way that, that is unprecedented, and his Republican rivals are talking about it. Right. Everything inside of that courtroom is going to matter inside the courtroom. Public opinion among the Republican electorate is going to matter outside of the courtroom. And polling suggests right now that two thirds of Republican voters believe that Joe Biden is an illegitimate president. There has been no significant consequence that Donald Trump has faced among Republican voters since the aftermath of the 2020 election and the January 6th attack. We saw Ron DeSantis today really for the first time take a switch at Donald Trump around his actions on January 6th, suggesting that perhaps Donald Trump didn't do enough today, that day, to quell the violence that was ongoing. And what happened? Donald Trump's campaign has promoted Ron DeSantis's criticisms because they feel like the right. Republican well, electorate, me... at least enough to win this primary, is on their side and on this particular issue. And they're sympathetic let... to Donald Trump. Let me just play that bite since you referenced it. He should have come out more forcefully, of course that. But to try to criminalize that, that's a, diff that's a different issue entirely. We can't keep dealing with this drama. We can't keep dealing with the negativity. We can't keep dealing with all of this. And Vaughn, so that was DeSantis and Nikki Haley there, who says we can't deal with the drama. She might not be able to. His Republican rivals right. may not want to. Voters don't seem to care. Right. Primary and, voters. you know, I think it's notable that primary voters, I think the general election will be a whole nother conversation. But for the primary, we have seen his numbers hold on here. And we're six months away from the Iowa caucus. That's about 180 days. You know how many days it's been since January 6th? About 960 something days here. And so we have seen uh, largely Republicans try to run away from uh, taking Donald Trump directly on about his actions after the 2020 election. Uh, and now the question is, can they try and are, can they effectively uh, uh, swing enough voters away from Donald Trump and convince them his actions in the uh, aftermath of the 2020 election should not uh, are, are unbecoming of somebody who should serve in the White House again? Vaughn Hilliard live for us in that key early state of New Hampshire. Laura Jarrett, our legal correspondent, joining us as well. I want to get to Maura Barrett, who's live for us in Chicago, because Maura, we talked about how part of this investigation by the special counsel involves these so-called fake electors. Now Michigan, as you're reporting, is the latest state to open an investigation into one of those plots. Yeah, Hallie, this development happening kind of in the shadow of these big headlines around the former president today. But the Michigan State Attorney General announcing charges that appear to be the first formal charges around this whole fake elector scheme that we've seen in several states, charging 16 individuals. The Attorney General laying out uh, that these people allegedly met covertly in the basement of the Michigan Republican Party uh, headquarters in December of 2020. So about a month, a little more than a month after the election back in November 2020, charging them with multiple felony accounts, eight counts each involving forgery and conspiracy to commit election law forgery. Uh, and so this is something that she said these people knowingly met uh, to then sign and uh, say that they were the electors to then put former President Trump and uh, former Vice President Pence back into office. The attorney general saying, quote, that was a lie. I want you to hear from their video announcement today where she acknowledges the political drop backdrop that all this is happening amongst. Undoubtedly, there will be those who claim these charges are political in nature. But where there is overwhelming evidence of guilt in respect to multiple crimes, the most political act I could engage in as a prosecutor would be to take no action at all. Now, I should note, I reached out to the Michigan Republican Party. We haven't heard anything back from them in terms of reaction or comment on this, but we have heard some of the defendants, some of these people that have been charged in the past, some of them claiming that they didn't know what they were signing or what they were doing when all of that happened. So this is something we'll obviously stay close on in Michigan, but also in several other key battleground states uh, where we might also see other charges, more investigations come out around this fake elector scheme. We've seen it being brought up in Georgia, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. 
Wisconsin, Arizona, uh, Nevada. So obviously uh, these key battleground states that President Trump was really potentially looking to go after back in 2020. So this is definitely the not, not the last time we'll be talking about this, Hallie. I bet not more. Barrett, thank you. We've got some breaking news coming into us in just the last hour because military officials are now naming that U.S. soldier who apparently voluntarily ran across the border into North Korea where he's being detained tonight. 23-year-old private second class Travis King was being sent home from South Korea, apparently facing military disciplinary actions when he joined a tour of the DMZ. This is the area you see here. It's like the village right there on the demilitarized zone separating North from South Korea. And he just bolted, took off right across that military demarcation line, as it's called, right into North Korean custody. And if you're like, wait, how did he end up on a private tour? That happens. You can do that. That happens all the time. Um, it's this area you're seeing here. You probably remember it from when President, former President Trump uh, met with Kim Jong-un, the North Korean dictator, for a photo op, essentially, in 2019. It's like literally a line you can, and apparently this guy did, run over it. All of it's just 30 miles from Seoul, where an agreement was signed that paused, not ended, but paused the war between the two countries years ago. NBC's Keir Simmons is covering this one for us. Um, this is a, a lot of murkiness, I think, fair to say, Keir, around what happened here. Motivation, more about this soldier. The bottom line, though, is that the U.S. has got to figure out how to get him back, right? How are they going to do it? Yeah, it's a good question. A lot of a lot of Merkinus is right. Just a little bit more detail that we have uh, learned uh, just in the last uh, few minutes, uh, Hallie, from a U.S. official uh, confirming that uh, Private King is 23 years old, that he was supposed to return to Fort Bliss, uh, Texas, uh, and uh, that he has been in the Army for around two and a half years. There is lots we don't know, though. We don't know why he made this this dash across the line, which was incredibly dangerous. It, it, it is watched by both sides uh, on a hair trigger, frankly. So it, it, quite stunning that he did this. And now, as you say, the, the question is, how uh, do, does the U.S. get uh, Private, uh, Private King back? Now, there aren't formal diplomatic relations between the U.S. and North Korea, and uh, over the past few years, relations, diplomatic relations have really been in the deep freeze, with uh, North Korea testing intercontinental ballistic missiles capable of reaching the U.S. mainland. Uh, so uh, the talks need to start in some way or other. I suppose maybe the actual talks themselves might be a good thing, uh, but for uh, the U.S. government right now, the focus is on trying to work out how to get Private uh, uh, King back. Take a listen. One of our service members who was on a tour uh, willfully and without authorization crossed the military demarcation line. I'm absolutely foremost concerned about the welfare of our troops. And so we will remain focused on this. And again, uh, this this will develop in the next uh, uh, several days now. Hallie, that, those words from Secretary Austin, without authorization, I think that's a message to Pyongyang, to Kim Jong Un, just to say we didn't want this to happen. That's right. We didn't instruct right. him to do this. Uh, don't react adversely uh, because of this. From a geopolitical perspective, Kier, I mean, this is. North Korea essentially getting handed something that North Korea always wants, which is attention from America. Yeah. Oh, I, you know, actually, about 20 U.S. citizens have been held by North Korea since the mid-90s. It, it happens more than you realize. Yes, I think you're right that the, the North Korean leadership really wants attention. That's one of the reasons why it carries out all of these missile tests, as well as the fact that it is trying to develop its, nuclear, its missile capability. Uh, so, uh, yes, I, 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 if they believe, and, and it's, you have to remember how isolated this, this, this regime can be, if they believe that this is as the U.S. is describing it, then they may well think of it as something that is kind of beneficial, politically beneficial. But I, we're really in the early stages. Hard to know how uh, the North Koreans are reacting at this stage. Kier Simmons, live for us on all of it with, I'm sure, more to come uh, in the next few days and weeks. Kier, thank you. you bet. Tonight, some new and urgent warnings around the world about the risk of heart attacks, even death, as heat waves are gripping both the U.S. and Europe, especially because the lows are not very low at all. Take Phoenix. The coldest that it's getting there at night, the coldest, is above 90 degrees. It's been like that for nine straight days. The highs are above 110. 
It's been that way for two and a half weeks. That's the longest streak ever there. It is putting pressure on the power grid as people are obviously running those air conditioners. We're just finding out in the last couple of minutes that preliminary data shows the power grid in Texas hit a record high for the second day in a row. In Europe, you've got red alerts where you see them here, fuchsia, basically, on, on camera, on screen there. South and east of Europe, including at some popular tourist sites like at the Colosseum, Sicily and Sardinia could get close to breaking records if they hit 118 degrees as is expected in the next couple of days. The heat's making it harder to fight wildfires burning out of control in Greece, Spain, and Switzerland. Claudia Lavagna is in Rome now with more. Well, today the temperature in Rome reached 107 degrees Fahrenheit. That is officially the hottest temperature ever recorded uh, in this city, and the impact is in front of everybody's eyes. Now, this is one of the uh, most popular squares in the whole of Rome, and usually it's full of people, especially at this time of the day. And at this time of the year, it's the peak of the tourist season. And as you can see, there's barely anybody, apart from the odd tourist uh, that is filling up bottles and uh, freshen up a bit, and that one of the many uh, drinkable water fountains that are dotted uh, around the city. And talking about tourists, we spoke today uh, to the head of the uh, civil, uh, civil Protection Agency here uh, in Rome, who told us that today, because it was the hottest day of the year, it was expected to be, um, they deployed tens of volunteers called the Angeli del Freddo, or the Angels of Freshness, freshness um, uh, ready to hand out bottles or help out tourists as well as citizens who um, found it difficult to cope with this kind of uh, heat wave. And he told NBC News that uh, most people, the vast majority of people they had to help were tourists because he said that the Italians listened to the advice, they stayed home in the hottest hours of the day, but perhaps the tourists, because they have a limited time, they didn't want to uh, shorten or ruin uh, their holidays, so they were out and about. Now, uh, he said that many were unprepared. Uh, they, were, they had no water, they uh, were not wearing a hat, uh, and and about 11 uh, people either fainted or fell ill uh, because of the heat wave. And this is just the volunteers from the Civil Protection Agency. He said that probably uh, the emergency services helped a lot uh, more uh, people than that. Now, there's also a different kind of uh, impacts of this uh, heat wave. Uh, for instance, the rock band Muse, uh, which is uh, playing here at the stadium in Rome uh, tonight, uh, they were so concerned about the health of fans having to spend many hours uh, in these heats that they moved uh, their concerts to later in the day. And they even advised or warned their fans on social media uh, not to show up too early at their concert. Well, not very rock and roll. Our thanks to Claudia Lavagna for that reporting. To Pennsylvania now, where police tonight say their search for two little kids swept away by a flash flood may shift soon from a rescue on the ground to a recovery in the water if they don't find those children tonight. Listen. That will mean underwater assets, mainly in the creek, and we will work out from there. We are going to begin to scale down for the land has been covered and it has all been tracked by GPS. This is day four of that desperate search in Bucks County. Some nearby roads have been closed so searchers can cover more ground faster. But potentially complicating the operation here, crews are bracing for more rain and maybe even more flash flooding toward the end of the week after getting so hard over the past weekend, getting hit so hard, I should say. Emily Aketa is joining us now. Talk us through the latest. Hey there, Hallie. Well, we've been talking about the whole host of resources that the multiple police agencies have been pouring into this very urgent search, looking for a two-year-old girl, Maddie, and her younger brother, a nine-month-old boy, Conrad Shields. That continues after that deadly flash flooding we saw play out over the weekend. They've used drones, they've used dogs, boats, as you're seeing on your screen. About roughly 100 people also canvassing the area on foot. Well, because those search efforts, they have led to no no, no avail. They've had no luck in finding those uh, those young children. They're going to now be shifting their focus to the water, to the creek. They're going to be doing dive missions. And so this is really the firmest acknowledgement from authorities at this point that this is a recovery mission. Police say that they are looking for two missing angels. They continue to remind people to stay away from the flood zone. It stretches about a mile and a half long. They've already gone over it for about more than a dozen times, they say. It's an area that's 
that's prone to flooding. It's familiar with flooding between the Delaware River, but then also all of these winding small creeks. So when you get an absolute inundation of water, it's going to wash over the area. They say 11 cars were trapped on this section of roadway that is continues to be closed. And they described that there was no option. People in those cars could do nothing because of the pace of the water rising. Now, authorities did manage to rescue on Saturday uh, several people, both from the road, also from uh, the waterway, but they did not have such luck for 32-year-old Katie Seely and two of her young children. In addition to those people, four others died in Bucks County, Hallie. Just, uh, just a really tragic, a tragic story showing just how dangerous flooding can be. It's just uh, horrific. Um, my, my hometown right there. Uh, Emily Aketa, thank you so much. Lots of people thinking and praying for those folks tonight. Appreciate it. Some new and stunning allegations tonight. The Texas officials have been given orders to push migrant kids and others back into the river at the border. With a state trooper calling it inhumane that those migrants aren't being given water in this heat, alleging that some of them are getting hurt on razor wire, with one woman allegedly stuck on the wire while suffering a miscarriage. That's according to internal emails. You can see them here, obtained by NBC News, first reported by the Houston Chronicle. A senior Customs and Border Protection official tells our team that wire, this is like concertina wire, razor wire hung by Texas DPS, is hurting migrants, which is why the Border Patrol is doing more to try to help. But a spokesperson for the Texas Department of Public Safety tells NBC News the allegations this trooper is making are, in their words, outrageous. And there's been some additional pushback late tonight from Operation Lone Star. That's the operation put in place by the Texas governor, Greg Abbott, to try to stop illegal immigration. NBC's Julia Ainsley is joining us now with more. Um, and it is extraordinary what is being alleged by this state trooper here uh, of the way that some of these migrant children and babies um, and, and people coming across are being treated. Yeah, it's unbelievable. This is one of their own, someone from within their ranks. As we know, in Texas, under this Operation Lone Star, started in 2021 by Governor Greg Abbott, he moved some people who have never seen the border down to the border. One of those people saw some things that he just couldn't keep to himself, and he sent an email internally to Texas DPS that's now been obtained by the Houston Chronicle and by us, where he details some things, like the four-year-old who was passing out from exhaustion and not given water, like a man who had to tear his child off of that razor sharp concertina wire. I've seen it being hung. It was definitely being built up right around the lifting of Title 42 in May. Now, DHS is weighing in on this, even though they're the federal The federal agency, here. to be clear, this is if there's a distinction between what's happening at the state level, it seems, and federal. And that's really what tells this whole story, because usually immigration is a federal issue, but Greg Abbott wanted to make it a state issue, and that's when he began this operation. And they said, look, CBP actually does have some problems with this because it impedes their operation when they have to go in and rescue. And in a statement, they said, this report is troubling if true. It is cruel and inhumane, and we can both enforce our laws and treat human beings with dignity. We mentioned that new statement from Operation Lone Star. It's more pushback, right? Yeah, they're saying, look, this is outrageous. We've issued no orders or directions that would compromise human lives. So, so they're I, saying they didn't order people and babies and kids to be pushed back into the river. They're saying be, we didn't do that. Yeah, let's talk about what orders mean. Yes. Here. So there was never a memo that went out that said, hey, keep all the babies out and don't give any Body water. But according to this person who was down there, this trooper who witnessed it firsthand, he was ordered by other people mm. within Texas DPS not to administer that. Now, when I got on the phone with Texas DPS today, they said, look, if we give water to everybody, they're just going to want to keep coming across the river. We'll step in when we think it's a medical emergency. And we urge our state troopers to use common sense. But, you know, the line can get gray there, and it can get dangerous. Where does this go? In other words, is there going to be an investigation? Do the, does the federal agency have any sort of jurisdiction to come and oversee Operation Lone Star? It is, a, like I said, it's a little bit murky here because of the federal versus state distinction. About who could step in and yeah. who could actually claim harm. We often see states suing the federal government over their policies, perhaps we would see this go the other way if it got to that point. Julia Ainsley, thank you so much for that. Appreciate you bringing us that reporting. Also breaking in just the last couple of hours, we have learned here at NBC News that Las Vegas police have searched a home in connection to the murder of Tupac, a murder that's gone unsolved for something like 30 years. He died, remember, at the age of 25 after being shot in a drive-by in Vegas. Uh, this is some footage from back then. I don't have to tell you how huge of a star Tupac Shakur was. Um, short but legendary career. He has sold tens of millions of records worldwide. A lot of that coming after his death. There has never been an arrest in this case. 
And police say this new search that they're confirming now is part of an investigation, even all these years later, into Tupac's death. Noah Pransky is joining us now. Do we have any indication that this means they're any closer to solving the killing of Tupac? No, just like leads have been scant over the years on this case, so are details tonight from Las Vegas police. Um, they put out a very short statement. You saw what you saw is what we know at this hour. And there really hasn't been much more today other than the fact that we know where this took place. We know it, it was in Henderson, Nevada, which is a suburb of Las Vegas, just to the southeast of it. We know that Nevada does not have a statute of limitations on homicide cases. So it appears that it is still an open case, maybe one that if the shooter is still alive, they could potentially bring to justice. But as you mentioned, Hallie, there has never been an arrest. We don't know. There are, of course, suspicions, but we don't know yet who pulled the trigger. Um, and because there was a lot of gang involvement, because there was a lot of East Coast, West Coast war at the time, a lot of police departments involved, a lot of accusations, we just don't have any answers yet. I have to say that when we're talking about the death of Tupac, we would be remiss if we didn't also talk about the conspiracy theories that he is not, in fact, dead, right? This whole Tupac is still alive thing has been around for years. And I have to think that the news of this search might, might refuel some of that again. There's a lot of conspiracy theories. They all generally involved him surviving the shooting or an imposter getting shot and Tupac surviving the assassination attempt. Living out his years since then in either Cuba, Malaysia, or another foreign country, and one day coming back. Of course, NBC News has no evidence any of these things are true. Um, they have been echoed, though, by family members, by his former bodyguard, by former record executives, um, including Suge Knight. So these things sell a lot of records. They make a lot of headlines. Expect a lot more of them this week. But right now, we have no, no information whatsoever to believe that Tupac Shakur is anything but passed away for the last 27 years. Noah Pransky, thank you very much. Coming up here in the show, the fittest city in America, not too far from where I'm sitting right now. See if where you live made the top of the list. Plus, the U.S. football team buying a big British one. We're going to explain in our five things. Stay with us. Investigators in Oregon say they have a person of interest in the deaths of four women in the Portland area. Deaths that seem to be linked, they say. Even though just last month, Portland police told people to stop speculating about a possible serial killer. The victims, Ashley Rial, Kristen Smith, Charity Perry, and Bridget Webster. Police are also looking into the deaths of two other women, which may be connected as well. Stephen Romo has more. Yeah, hey, Holly, six women were discovered dead between February and May, all within the same 100-mile area around Portland. Now, that sparked fears about a serial killer. That's a term law enforcement has not used. In fact, police had said previously these cases weren't connected. But they're now saying they believe four of those deaths may, in fact, be linked. Take a look at this timeline. 22-year-old Kristen Smith was found dead in February. 24-year-old Charity Perry was found two months later in April. Then days later, 31-year-old Bridget Webster was also found dead. Just a week oh, after that, a little more than a week after that, another victim, Ashley Rial, was found dead on May 7th. Another case in that same time span was an unidentified woman. Police later said foul play was not suspected there, but yet another case, 32-year-old Joanna Speaks, was also found dead in April. Investigators have not indicated that Speaks is connected to the other four, but her family is holding out hope for answers, saying in a statement yesterday, quote, we are in direct communication with our detective to verify why our sister's name has not been linked to the person of interest, along with the four other girls as of this morning. We're extremely thankful, however, that we are one step closer to getting answers for the families. Charity Perry's mom also spoke with our affiliate KGW about about the anguish they're experiencing. I'm doing better than I was the, the first week. Uh, I, I got my blood pre pressure a little more under control. The DA's office points out no charges have been filed in, against anyone in these cases, but they say they do have a person of interest connected to these four cases of Smith, Perry, Webster, and Rial. Now, they have not released much information about that person. They do, however, say they don't believe there is any active danger to the community right now. Hallie?
Our thanks to Stephen Romo for that. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, police say the suspect in the Gilgo Beach serial killings had more than 200 guns at home. They said he had an arsenal in a vault, essentially. They're trying to figure out if the guns are legally registered. Police spokesperson says they're not sharing anything else about what specifically was seized. Number two, Illinois could become the first state to end cash bail after its Supreme Court said today the plan to get rid of it does not violate the Constitution in Illinois. So this change means it'll be up to a judge to decide whether somebody will be held while they wait for trial or not. It's set to go into effect in a couple of months. Number three, the fittest city in the country, Arlington, Virginia, for the sixth year in a row, just across the river from where I'm sitting in D.C. The American College of Sports Medicine says that's because Arlington has the highest percentage of people who have exercised in the last 30 days and the lowest percentage of people with diabetes. Next up, D.C. here and then Seattle. Who knew? Number four, the San Francisco 49ers owners just took full control of the English soccer club Leeds United, making them now football owners in the U.S. and football club owners overseas as well. The incoming chairman said it's a big moment, a necessary reset for the club. You might have heard of him before. Some U.S. men's national teams players have been on it. Number five, your daily Powerball update. Normally, I'm like, well, this one's at a billion dollars. It's at a billion dollars. That is a lot of money. Um, the jackpot tomorrow is the seventh biggest ever in this country, so top ten. It's also the third highest ever for Powerball. I'm going to just say what I, you're probably not going to win. I wish you the best of luck. You're probably not going to be successful. In fact, I'm going to bet you're not You're not going to win. But maybe if one of our viewers wins, let me know. I offer you an exclusive interview here on the show. Let's take you out west, where your double-double animal style is going to be served up a little differently. With a smile you can see, apparently, because one of the country's most popular burger chains is now telling some of its workers they cannot wear masks. Masks are going to be banned unless you have a doctor's note. In and out. So that's because they want customers to be able to see workers' smiles. If workers don't do it, they can be fired. It applies to almost all of the employees for In-N-Out. Um, it's definitely for the states you see here, but not for the In-N-Out chains in California and Oregon, because in those states, banning masks is not allowed. There, workers can only wear company-approved masks. Remember, the CDC says in about 60% of people in this country have a chronic condition that puts them more at risk for getting COVID. Everybody has their own unique situation. Some people have pre-existing medical conditions. Um, some people have, may have uh, family members at home who are high risk and they don't want to bring anything home with them. So if people want to wear masks, we should let them wear masks. Investopedia editor-in-chief Caleb Silver is joining us now. What? It felt like the whole mask debate was over. People were kind of doing like a live and let live thing. It, uh, is serving a burger with a smile, I guess in and out is making the decision that that's important to their bottom line? Yeah, and they want clear and effective communication between their customers and their associates. Like, I want a double burger with cheese and those animal fries. Want to make sure we can hear that. But this is a company sort of enforcing its own mandates on its employees. It's a privately held company. It can do this. They, they're allowed to do it. That's they legally can, allowed, yes. Right, and they can fire employees if they do not obey. Um, this is not the first time that we've seen In-N-Out make some decisions around COVID um, that have had some pushback here. When the vaccine mandates came into play in California. The company opposed that. Um, they're a big donor to the Republican Party in that state. They also are known for stamping Bible verses and some of the packaging here. From a business perspective, is this business mixed with a side of politics, in your view? I think so, and also some ideology. These, this is a company that has been privately held for years, since 1948 or so. It is run by a billionaire. She is Lindsay Snyder. She's the grandchild of Harry and Esther Snyder. Very religious family. She is very religious. She's been outspoken about that. So you can get John 316 inside of every uh, cup. You can get Proverbs 24, 16 on your fries, Luke 635 on coffee cups. This is their agenda. It doesn't affect their business. Again, a privately held company that's super popular and has a pretty big fan base. Well, that's my question. It's will it affect their business? Because California is a liberal state, right? Like California is also a place. And I say California because In-N-Out has a billion burger joints in California. It's also a state where people love their In-N-Out. You know what I mean? So do we think there's going to be any pushback? What's the reaction been so far from customers, from people who love In-N-Out? Well, it's funny because the outcry is on both sides. There are people supporting the decision by In-N-Out and there are people opposing it, as you might expect. So I don't think it's going to hurt their business at all. People that like In-N-Out like In-N-Out. They're going to go for those animal fries and that double burger. That's what they want. That's what they're going to get. And the company can do whatever it wants. It's privately held.
Caleb Silver, thank you so much. It's good to see you here on the set. When we come back, we'll take you live to South Carolina, where Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is laying out his plan to change the military because he says it's too woke. We'll explain. Plus, what a woman in Australia says she was doing before a dingo attacked her on a beach. That's later this hour. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis tonight taking his culture war message to the military, laying out a plan to go after, in his words, the woke mind virus inside the armed services. Listen to how he's framing it on CNN later, uh, late this afternoon. I think you've had a big problem uh, with morale. You clearly have a problem with recruiting. And at this level, everybody has acknowledged these recruiting levels are at a crisis. Why is that the case? I think it's because people see the military losing its way, not focusing on the mission and focusing on a lot of these other things. It's all happening as DeSantis becomes the first Republican candidate to register for the South Carolina primary. You see him doing that there. One of the first primaries on the calendar and a race that could boost or doom a campaign. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez is traveling with the governor in Columbia, South Carolina. He's joining us now. So let's talk about the woke mind virus, as DeSantis alleges. He has made this sort of anti-woke agenda a huge focus of his campaign, but it's a campaign that has had some stumbles that is stagnating in the polls, for example. He's still putting his eggs in the anti-woke basket, clearly. Yeah, clearly, Hallie. And look, that uh, phrase, woke, he uses it to describe a lot of things. Talking about education, now talking about the military. He rolled out his immigration policy a few weeks ago, mentioned it there. And also, there's this back and forth over insurance in Florida. And the word woke keeps coming up over and over again. Now, the governor today rolled out that military plan. It was, of course, overshadowed by much of the Trump news. But let's tick through that military plan, if we can throw up a full screen of what some of it is. It includes eliminating DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion programs in the military, banning government buildings from flying any flag other than the U.S. Uh, U.S. flag or the U.S. military, revoking an order allowing transgender personnel to serve as their preferred sex, banning taxpayer funds for sex changes, hormones, or gender surgeries, banning drag shows on bases, and reinstating soldiers discharged for not getting vaccinated, also ending climate change programs. So, Hallie, those are just some of the things that Governor DeSantis laid out today, and he spoke about it earlier at an event at a veterans hall. Take a listen. Right now, the military is using your tax dollars to pay for hormones and sex change operations for people in the military. Look, I, I, not my cup of tea. I, I don't think any tax dollars should ever go to that. And so, Hallie, this is all part of a strategy, too, where he's highlighting his military service. Of course, he served as a Navy uh, JAG lawyer back uh, in Iraq, and he's hoping that that may gain him some traction as well as the so-called woke mind virus with GOP primary voters here in South Carolina, Hallie. You talk about South Carolina. Uh, it's circled on my calendar. It is like marked on the GCAL there because it comes after Iowa and New Hampshire and I think right. maybe Nevada this, uh, Nevada this year had a Super Tuesday. Um, what's so interesting about DeSantis going to South Carolina and kind of planting his flag there is not just the competition he faces in the state from people who know that state well. I'm thinking of Senator Tim Scott, for example, obviously Nikki Haley, um, but the way that it feels like perhaps him trying to take out an insurance policy in case his showing in Iowa and New Hampshire isn't as strong as he'd hoped. Sure, it, it could be a key uh, state, of course, and he is the first candidate to file in the uh, South Carolina GOP primary, even ahead of Nikki Haley and Tim Scott. So clearly his campaign views it as a huge deal, especially because there will be more time in between those first primaries in South Carolina this time. So he expects to spend more time here. But Halley, Iowa is still key for this campaign. His campaign sent, sending a lot of resources to Iowa. And if he doesn't have a strong showing there, the question might be at that point, will he even get to South Carolina, especially since his campaign is burning through so much cash in these early few weeks, Hallie. Gabe Gutierrez, live for us there in Columbia, traveling with Governor DeSantis. Thank you, Gabe. Coming up, an NBC News exclusive with the parents of that woman who went missing in Alabama say about the moments their daughter appeared back on their doorstep 48 hours after vanishing. 
plus why protesters in Israel are shutting down highways and train stations today. Coming up. To a new exclusive interview you will only see here on NBC News. The parents of that Alabama woman who went missing telling us now that she fought for her life, physically and mentally, before she made it to their doorstep. Watch. We tried to hug her as best we could, but I had to stand back because she was not in a good state. So we had to stand back and let medical let professionals work with her. her. Um, but... It's Incredibly emotional there for the parents of Carly Russell, who, remember, disappeared Thursday, not long after calling 911 to report a toddler walking alone on the highway. When officers got there, there was no sign of Russell or the child. But on Saturday night, she showed up, as you just heard, at her parents' front door. Her parents tell NBC they cannot share details about how Carly made it home or what she says happened while she was missing because of the investigation that's happening now. But they say their daughter was abducted. They think whoever did it is still out there. Priscilla Thompson is joining us now. Priscilla, um, it is just an incredible exclusive, and thank you for speaking to her parents. Tell us more about what they're telling you. Yeah, Hallie, they described the joy they felt when they first saw her show up on their doorstep. But then you heard her mother saying that she wanted to give her a hug, but she saw that she wasn't in a good state. And so ultimately, they had medics transport her to the hospital. And I asked the parents about those hours and days after she came home from the hospital. And they said that first night that she asked to sleep with them in the bed, she didn't even want to sleep by herself, that she has been experiencing uh, nightmares and she is easily triggered is what they are saying. And they're also concerned about the speculation that has been happening on social media as questions are growing about uh, how all of this happened and where exactly she was and what happened. And they are saying that uh, Carly has seen some of those things and it's been very upsetting for her. And so they're asking people to let this investigation play out. And I also asked them about the statement that was made by her boyfriend that she had been fighting for her life life for 48 hours and I want to play a bit of that exchange do you believe she was fighting for her life oh, she definitely fought for her life. there were moments when she physically had to fight for her life and there were moments when she had to mentally fight for her life but she made it back to you she, she made, made it, it back, back and that's all that matters and one of the most emotional points of that interview is when they talked about those 48 hours when they were searching for their daughter and they said that they would receive hoax phone calls that people would text and call claiming to be Carly and they would get their hopes up even going to a hotel to search for her and ultimately it wasn't her but thankfully they are so happy to have her back with them now. Hallie? What else do we know from police about this investigation? There are still a lot of questions here, Priscilla. Like, are they still looking for a, for a toddler, the one that Carly Russell allegedly says she saw? Do we know anything more? Yeah, that is the big question. They are declining to say. What we know is that they are analyzing that initial 911 call, that uh, traffic video showing the car with the hazard, light, hazard lights on on the interstate around the time that she disappeared. They're also analyzing all the things they found at the crime scene, the car, her purse, her cell phone, all of that. And the police chief telling me that the public deserves to know what happened, and he does intend to share that information once this investigation concludes. Hallie? Priscilla Thompson live for us there in Hoover, Alabama. Priscilla, thank you. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day, and because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our foreign desk has done it for you. Here is some of what they're keeping an eye on in a segment we call The Global. In Israel, we have seen protests escalate today with tens of thousands of people blocking train stations and highways across the country. Look at this. You see police spraying people with water cannons. It's the 28th consecutive week of demonstrations from people who are angry over the prime minister's plan to limit the power of the Supreme Court. That's something that could happen as soon as next week. The government says the plan, they say, would improve democracy. Out of Australia, a woman there says she's lucky to be alive after being attacked by a pack of dingoes while running on a beach there. She was airlifted to the hospital and is now in stable condition. This is the third incident involving this particular pack. Officials are still trying to figure out what to do with them. And in Italy, the country's antitrust watchdog is opening an investigation on inflated ticket prices for the Coliseum. 
Tourists are complaining about big companies scooping up tickets and then overcharging for tours. Reuters says a ticket from the Coliseum website should be about 20 bucks. Local guide companies are selling for like four times as much, something like 80 bucks a pop in some instances. Still to come, messy mania, only getting bigger in Miami. What David Beckham is telling our Guadvenegas about Messi's impact, his legacy, and expectations for his first game. Let's talk Messi mania because Lionel Messi today is on the field for his first practice with his new American team, Inter Miami. I mean, hey, that's after the fireworks on Sunday. Then this, he's just one of the guys doing a little joggy around the field, a little, a little light paced stepper there. He got, he got in some drills with the team. Chill vibes all around. We're talking about practice, after all. It's not a game, it's practice. Coach David Beckham, co-owner, I should say, not coach, co-owner David Beckham was on the sidelines watching sort of this new star recruit, if you will, talking today to Guadmanegas and a couple of others about what Messi could help teach his teammates. Look. They see Leo turn up earlier than they're turning up. They mm -hmm. see him leave later than they leave. They see him doing the right things, you know, the way he works. These are professional players that have played at the top level and won everything that you can in the game. So our young players can only learn from those moments. Guad Venegas is joining us now. What else did Beckham say about Messi? And importantly, is he going to play um, in the first game coming up? Well, Ali, I think Beckham wanted to make sure that people have the right expectation. And yeah. it takes time for a player to get used to a team. He has to get used to the new players. Also playing in the humidity here in Miami. It is not the same to play under this heat, which, by the way, we're still under extreme weather here. In fact, that those videos that we're seeing of him training, he came out for 10 minutes, and then they gave him and the rest of the team a water break. So uh, there's a lot of factors, not, not just, of course, the weather, but getting used to uh, the plays that that team, um, the, you know, just the way they play, the, the team they're playing against. So anyhow, uh, Beckham wanted everyone to understand that it's going to be a uh, gradual. Here's a uh, part of what he said about Messi uh, playing with the team. It doesn't matter who you are and how good you are. You need to you need time to adapt to, you know, the, the, the surface to, to your teammates um, and obviously to a different league as well. So he needs to be given time. It doesn't matter whether it's uh, Lionel Messi. He needs to be given time to adapt. And again, the decision of whether or not Messi will play and if he comes in as a sub is up to the coach. Uh, Beckham did say that. So Tata Martino, the new coach, will decide. I think what we all expect Messi to play at some point. You've got the hype. You've got the fans that are buying tickets to come see him play. Usually, Hallie, when it's a player that comes in the way Messi did, he just started training today, and this game is in a couple days. Right. Usually, they will play in the second half at some point. I get that. But Messi is not the usual. So, I, I mean, I hear you. I take your point. And I wonder, you know, um, I know coming from somebody who knows a lot about football in the American uh, sphere and very little about football as the rest of the world sees it, um, w is Inter Miami going to be good? Like, with Messi on board, do they think that Inter Miami is going to win a championship? Or is that, like, too much of an expectation here? Hallie, for a second, when you said football, I was like, oh, she's referring to the sport as football, the, the way they do all over the world. But you were referring to American football, of course. Well, when it comes to Messi, it's difficult uh, to really know what's going to happen, right? You never know uh, what can happen with a player like Messi coming here. You know, he's a number 10. Uh, the skills that a player like him will bring here are not only going to help his team and uh, bring those skills on the field, but also coaching the younger players. That's what Beckham was talking about. So there's a lot that can be said, but anything can happen here. Um, I think that the, the one thing that Messi does bring to the table uh, that no other players can bring the way he does is that if he gets the ball and he can make a play unlike anyone else and it takes one play, it takes two minutes for him to bring his magic and score a goal unlike others because of the skills that he has that uh, the world class and of course that make him arguably the best player in the world, Hallie. Glad Venegas, thank you very much. That does it for us for this hour and the one before it. Top Story picks up our coverage right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.